so let's roll. This is uh, a, we got this one uh, like a couple days ago, and it's kind of a long one, so just bear with me. But I think it has some, it could be pretty good for everybody to hear it. Can you breathe some wisdom into this situation? Help. <laughs> I recently started dating an incredible man of God whose life bears fruit. Things have been going great. We're highly compatible and we just click. But then last week we discovered that we identify with different church denominations and therefore some the theological views are different. For example, he doesn't believe in the continuation of prophecy and tongues in our day. And I, of course, do believe in this. One thing I really respect about him is his hunger for understanding and his openness to being taught. That being said, he asked me to pray that the Lord would guide the both of us in truth and put us on one account concerning our differences in theology. We've both decided to study these items individually and then we'll share and study together. I think it's wonderful that he wants to do this, but I'm nervous that I'm making a mistake by pursuing someone who doesn't share these foundational beliefs. What if our beliefs never completely align? At the same time, I can't emphasize enough what a wonderful man of God he is and how open he also is to the wisdom and counsel. Should I continue in this relationship? Okay, that's a really good question. And I think that, you know, and it's just, I, I don't know if we've talked about this in a bit, but one of the things that I've talked about, I know I've talked about it on stage, I've talked about it in my books, I've talked about it on the show, I'm sure, and that's Smirk, S-M-I-R-K. And uh, matter of fact, I just found out that we're planning on doing a relationship conference in the new year. I think we're still trying to figure out what exactly we're going to call it. Some people want to call it naked. Some people want to call it stripped. Some people want to call it, it mm, please. Some people want to call it uh, smirk, or, I, hole. I feel like hole is, anyway, during that, that I'm sure I'm going to bring up smirk, S-M-I-R-K. My point is that you need to be in agreement. Somebody needs to stop that timer. I, I, Yes, you need to be in agreement about these five areas. And uh, if you're dating somebody, if you're in a relationship with somebody, if you're on your way to thinking, oh, we're going to be engaged, and you are with that person, you want to make sure that you're in agreement. The word says, can two walk together unless they be agreed to do so? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is no. You will not walk together if you are not in agreement. S-M-I-R-K. The S stands for sex. The M stands for money. The I is intangibles. The R is religion. The K is kids. You need to be in agreement about sex, what you're going to do, what you're not going to do, what a normal, healthy sexual relationship is. You need to be in agreement about that. If one person believes a normal, healthy sexual relationship is every day and another person believes, uh, the other person believes it's every month, you can't pray that problem away. You need to come to a middle ground about sex, about money. How are you going to spend your money? What kind of career decisions are you going to make? What happens if he has an opportunity in North Dakota? What happens if she has an opportunity in New York? Are you moving to New York for her? Those kinds of decisions are big, intangibles. They're all the little things. They mean a lot. If you're a super, super neat person and they're a mess, you got to figure out what that's going to be. Can you deal with that? Those small things are the things that really do in relationships. The R is religion, which connects to this thing, and I'll hold on for that. And the K is kids. Kids, how many are you going to have? How are you going to raise them? You believe in spanking? You believe in timeout? I believe in taking a timeout for whooping your behind. What, what, what are we going to do? I believe in public school. You believe in private school. How are we going to raise our kids? We have a tendency to raise children the way we were raised. Do you have children from a previous relationship? Can you trust him with your child? Can you trust her with your child? All the, your baby's mama and your baby daddy. Those kids' issues need to be discussed, okay? The R is religion. One person's saved, the other person's not. One person wants to go to World Overcomers, the other person wants to go to Potter's house. One person believes in tongues, the gifts of the spirit, prophecy that it is for today. The other person does not. A, a disagreement in the religious area is enough to destroy your relationship. Now, if you have somebody that's saying, hey, I'm open, I can still learn more, and I, there's still more to learn, and there's still more to see, and there's still more to, more to trust, I'm telling you right now, since I grew up in a denomination that was non-Pentecostal, I know his argument. He's coming out of the passage there in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that is saying where there's prophecy, they will, see, they will cease, where there's tongue, they will be stilled, where there's knowledge, it will pass away. And so that people who don't feel like tongues is for today are basing it on that one particular passage of scripture where Paul is saying tongues will cease and uh, that, that, that prophecy will cease and tongues will be stilled and knowledge will pass away, okay? And I get it. 
but it's a very limited perspective about that particular passage of scripture. And so I think that, but the ultimate question is, is he open to learn more? Is he open to experience some greater things? Here's the other thing. How important is that to you really? I mean, I believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe in tongues. I do pray in the spirit. I do, but we don't, I mean, we do it at church, but not really. I mean, if you came to World Overcomers, you're, you're not gonna come to World Overcomers and me, blah, 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 blah. It's just, it's not, I'm, and I'm not saying that I don't believe in it, that it's not important to me, but I, and I'm not trying to de-emphasize the role of the Holy Spirit because I think it's very powerful and I think it's important. Um, but you might have to ask when it comes to your personal relationship, how important is it that he believe in tongues? How important is it that he have a prayer language. Uh, I think a prayer language is great for your personal edification. I think that's awesome. The problem is that I've met a whole lot of tongue talkers whose lives are raggedy. Good God help us, Holy Ghost. I've met a whole lot of tongue, tongue, tongue talkers who don't love people. I, I know a whole bunch of people that are so into the gifts of the Spirit that they don't bear any of the fruit. And I'd rather have some fruit than gifts. I'd rather have some love and some joy and some peace I, I'd rather you talk a hundred words in English than a thousand words in a tongue. Don't speak in tongues in your heavenly language and cuss me out in English. <laughs> so so it, it would be better for you to speak English better. How about this? Speak English right first and then try to speak in, and don't let your tongue, don't think your tongues is going to overshadow you cussing your child out. <laughs> You're not going to get your little stank ah, rah, 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 one minute and then be in your, in your bedroom here and praying in a heavenly language over your child you just cussed out. But I'd almost rather you not cuss him out than to pray in a tongue. And so I think that we get denominational and we kind of have our little lines and grooves. And I think that the enemy's job is to exacerbate our differences and minimize the things that we share in common to try to separate us from one another. If he's really such a great guy and he really does love the Lord and he has a good job and he seems like he loves you and he's digging on you and you digging on him and stuff is flowing and growing and boom, 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 boom. And if you can agree about where to go to church, that's going to be the big issue. Can you agree about where to go to church? It's absolutely possible for you to go to a really great Baptist church or a really great Southern Baptist church that may not believe in tongues and the gifts of spirit. Still may be a good church. Doesn't mean it's not going to be a good church. And there's nothing. And if he ain't got no problem with you going in your prayer closet and praying in tongues, then why are you? Why would you have a problem with him not praying in tongues? I just don't. I I don't know when it comes to the intimacy of the relationship. I just don't know how important that is. Um, and I. I think it's important when it comes to being in agreement, but that only matters if it matters to you. Uh, believe me, there are some people, there are women who are watching this who are like, girl, I just wish I had a man who went to church, period. They, they would be just glad for a man who went to church. Does he go to church? Amen. That's all they want. They just want somebody who just saved enough to go to church. They're not getting into the nuances of whether or not he, can, what, he has a prophetic word for me. So it all depends on what's important to you. I hope I answered the question. Indeed. Uh, this is a, kind of a different style question, but I think it, it, you know, for all of the comic book fans out there, have you seen the, um, the new Avengers trailer? I have not seen the new Avengers trailers. I don't watch trailers. Please, I don't watch trailers. Please elaborate. I don't watch trailers at all. I like to get to the movies right before it starts. I don't like, I don't watch any trailers. I don't watch any previews. I get to the movies. If the movie starts at four, I get there like 10 past, 15 past. I get my popcorn, my candy, whatever. I go down there, I open up a door, see if it started. If it ain't started, I, I stand out there, I talk on the phone. I'll be talking to people and I just keep peeking in, keep peeking in. When, oh, when the lights get dark, then I run in and go grab my seat. I mean, I, I'll go in there and put my, putting some on my seat to protect, serve my seat. But pr previews are ridiculous. Trailers are ridiculous, especially previews. It's just too much. I went to, I was in a movie and I was, and I saw, a preview for the movie 
uh, it was the spinoff of The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. And I read the books. It was just out, just a little bit. It, I don't know what it was called, The Girl with the Dragon on her, in her, I don't know, whatever it was. And when I saw that they made another movie off of, off of the other books, I read the books. And, and I saw that, you know, they, they did the movies there because it it's a Swedish thing. And they did the movies there, but then they did an American version of it with Daniel Craig in it. I think it was Daniel Craig in it. And yeah, I, it, it wasn't Jennifer Lawrence. But anyway, whoever it was that was playing her, the girl, I mean, it was, there was some stuff in that, in that that was like, woo, definitely violated your soul. But anyway, when, when I saw that they were making a new one, a spinoff, I was like, oh, I'm definitely going to see it. I'm interested in it. Where did they take it? This is going to be great. But then I happened to be sitting in a movie, and they showed the preview, and they showed so much that when the preview was done, I screamed out loud, you showed us the whole movie. I know who the enemy, I know who the, Jesus, I didn't know, I, didn't, I had no idea. I like to walk into movies totally unaware. So I'll go to movies and I will enjoy them because I didn't know anything that was gonna happen. I walked into it dumb. And I, and I was there with people and they were like, that movie was okay. And I was like, what? Oh my God, I didn't know it was a vampire movie. When till, from dusk till dawn. Remember that movie back in the day? Some of y'all, you don't remember that movie, huh? George Clooney, Quentin Tarantino. It's like a Quentin Tarantino film. It was a movie called From Dusk Till Dawn. I didn't know nothing. I hadn't watched any of it. The fact that George Clooney was in it, Quentin Tarantino, Harvey Keitel. I was like, I'm going to go see it. I didn't watch any previews. I knew nothing, no trailers, no nothing. I walked into that movie ignorant. And I was there with somebody else who's you know, like one of my friends, Chris Hill or somebody like that. Because that movie's a long time ago. And when that movie, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it, they're in a bar or something and all of a sudden a vampires, I was like, vampires? I was, I, you could have knocked me over with a feather. I was like, oh my God. When we left out the movie, whoever I was with, they was like, movie's okay. I'm like, that movie's okay. <laughs> that movie blew my mind. I was like, I bought that movie. I own it. Back when you bought uh, DVDs or VHS tapes or Blu-ray discs or whatever, whatever it was. I rented it from Blockbuster. No, what I'm saying is, did I see the trailer? Nope. Am I going to see it? Of course I'm going to see the movie. And when I walk into that movie, I'm going to be stone cold ignorant. I'm not going to know what's going to happen. And if all of a sudden Thanos starts tap dancing in the middle of a scene, I'm going to be shocked. I'm not even going to know. So, no, I did not see the trailer. I don't want to see the trailer. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to know nothing about it. Somebody's around me, they see the movie before I've seen it, and they start talking about it, I tell them to shut up. Stop talking. Manny's so famous for that. Did you see it? No, I haven't seen it. Oh, well, let me tell you the whole dialogue. Let me tell you the whole topic. Let me, let me take you through the whole, and then, then, oh, no, brace yourself. I'm like, Manny, shut up. I don't want to know anything. Be quiet. Tell me nothing. Get out. Leave. I was upstairs and down, down here, listening to Manny telling the whole thing of, uh, Bohemian Rhapsody or something like that. He asked somebody, did you see Bohemian Rhapsody? The person's response was no. Your corresponding response should not be now to tell them the whole movie. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense, Manny Arango. What you're supposed to do is say, it was great, go see it. And if I trust you, I'll go see it. If I tell you this movie's good, don't pull up your computer and go, oh, let me look it up. No, trust me to say it was good. Believe me. Trust in God. Trust also in me. <laughs> if I tell you it's a good movie, then it'll be like, okay, it's going to be good. And just go see it and walk in there blind. Let something be a surprise. That's what's wrong with all y'all. Y'all never have no surprises. Never. When I was growing up, you just didn't know what anything was going on. The phone rang. You had no idea who it was. None at all. Okay. I mean, y'all know too much. 
Y'all have all this information at your fingertips. Me, if I wanted to know something, up, I had to look it up in the world book. I had to look it up in Encyclopedia Britannica. And if we didn't have that letter, then I just couldn't do, a, I couldn't do a report on rabbits because we didn't have the R book. And I just didn't know. Y'all know everything. Did you know that rabbits poop like raisins? I had no idea. Y'all know everything. There's no, no surprises. If I stumble across some rabbit crap, I'm totally shocked. I'm like, oh my God, the crap looks like raisins. And y'all are like, you didn't know that? Yes, I was reading on Wikipedia and it says that when rabbits crap. Because y'all know everything. Just let life catch you by surprise. It's great, it's a blessing. I feel like that's almost hard for us to do. Yeah. Because we're like, millennials are like built in this way where we just have to know. Right. So like surprises are. Yeah, back in the day it was like, people had the baby, what they have? What they have? That was the first thing. What do they have? Y'all are busting balloons and pff, blue and which I, I kind of actually like that. I, I, I like that. I'd rather buy your kid something that, you know, I know what I know what the kid is. But, you know, it's just there's no surprises. Y'all just. And my, my daughter is starting to turn into like like a little bit of a movie snob. Because not only is she watching trailers, but she's like watching YouTube videos of people who are critical of movies. And it's like giving the problems of the stuff that's wrong with the movie. And so I'm just like, see, see I don't, I won't be able to enjoy my life. I want to sit there with my candy. I'm, listen, I'm already smart. I don't go to the movies to be smart. I go to the movies to be dumb. I want to sit there with a box of Junior Mints and some popcorn and mix the salt and the sweet. And just, and just be entertained. That makes sense. Uh, okay, as much as I want to stay on this topic, which I really do, um, let's shift gears into something a tad bit more serious. Um, can you name a person who has had a tremendous impact on you as a leader, maybe someone who has been a mentor to you? Why and how did this person impact your life? I mean, that's a pretty loaded question. I mean, it's not, it's, it's loaded in that. I mean, I could, there's some, there's some very obvious people, you know, that I could, that I could talk about. I think that, um, I'm someone who gets different levels of inspiration from different people. So right now the, the, and I, I grew up in a denominational church. And, you know, my dad was the pastor of this church that was in a denomination. As much as I love my father, my father was really my father. He wasn't really all that inspirational to me when it came to the ministry. He just was my dad. And um, I got into a relationship after a, the first real spiritual relationship I got into that really made me be like, okay, now I want to be in the ministry was with this guy named Carlton Pearson, who's become a bit of a controversial figure at this point because he's kind of slipped into some her heretical thought. Um, but he was the first guy that really made me be like, okay. And I think some of that had to do with the fact that I felt like some of my gifts were similar to his. My dad and I are very, very different. Um, even though some people say to me all the time, you remind me of your father, you remind me of your father, but my father and I are very, very different people, very, very different personalities and different gifts. And uh, Carlton and I were a little bit more similar. Bishop Carlton Pearson and I were a little bit more similar. And so when I met him, he was something that I was kind of like, okay, wow, you know. Um, what I really learned from him is what not to do. Not even so much what to do, but what not to do, which is really great because what to do can be specific to an area, but what not to do is like a universal lesson. Carlton was the first person that really just believed in me and just thought I was the man. Um, and so I learned a lot from him and really learned a lot about ministry from him. Um, I learned a lot from my father too, I, I did. My father, the way I look at my father is my father's kind of style of ministry is army. And Carlton was Air Force. And I felt like I, was, I had more Air Force gifts um, even something like this is Air Force 
it's Air Force gifts. There, there aren't, everybody can't do this. This is Air Force. Some people are just really, really great with people. And my dad is really, really great with people. And it's not that I'm not good with people, but Carlton was a little bit more like this. And, um, but I, I, I got the balance from both of them. The guy that I'm connected to now, who's really just the pastor to me, um, is someone, I mean, everybody knows who he is, you know, Bishop Jakes and I, Chris introduced me to him eight years ago. And, and, um, I just, for a while, I just watched him from behind the scenes and, you know, really got a chance to see how well he could be trusted. Um, and the inspiration that I received from Bishop is, is, it's unequivocal and it's beyond just his words and it's beyond just his care for me as a person, which I absolutely feel that. He's one of the most um, genuinely loving, caring people who is huge, hugely famous and hugely blessed and hugely used, but very relational, really cares about you, which is just a big deal at this level. But more than anything, I just admire him for his faith and just his belief. You know, the word says not to think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather in sober judgment according to the measure of faith that God has given you. And uh, he, he challenges me. He inspires me to believe God for big, huge things. Um, and I think that that's very important to someone that's going to mentor you, um, is that they have to inspire you. You can't be with someone just out of obligation. You have to be with someone because they make you say, oh my God, I want to believe like that. I want to trust like that. And I, I, and man, your faith's at a whole nother level than mine. Oh my God, man. And she's Louise. How do you believe God like that? And actually, I just want to be, I just want to be on the team. Um, I think at every level, everybody's the best player until they get on a team with somebody that's better than them. <laughs> and when you get on a team with if you're if you're really good then if when you get on a team and you and there's a player who's better than you now you fall into a role on that team cuz they're just playing at a whole nother level but i think that finding a mentor and finding someone to really inspire you is almost an underrated concept paul said the things you have in Philippians 4, the things you have learned or received or heard or seen in me, put them into practice and the God of peace will be with you. And I think there's a significant aspect of peace that is connected to who you have learned or received or heard or seen in them. And you're putting those things into practice. We're just trying to get peace just from what we think we should do. But there's a significant aspect of peace that comes from the pattern that you follow. And if I say to you, Jarrell, just keep walking out this thing then even when the going gets tough, you'll be like, no, it's going to be okay because somebody I had confidence in told me to go this way. And so there's a peace that comes as a result of that. Uh, I think we're looking for that from church. We're looking that from a word. You're looking for that from inspiration, stuff like this. I hope that these, this stuff inspires you. And that's awesome. But at some point, you have to find a pattern. You need a role model besides just God. And you need someone else that you can look at. And I kind of quoted it earlier. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. So there's somebody in the earth that you trust. And that ability to trust that person in the earth brings a peace to your life that you will not have if you don't have that. I don't know if I answered the question, but. That's a great answer. Um, <clears throat> so he had a question about. Essentially, what are your thoughts on dating someone from a different religion? And that kind of segues into like a, something that just really happened in, in, I guess you would say, pop culture. Uh, are you familiar with Nick Jonas? Have you seen Quantico? I know who Nick Jonas is, just from the Jonas Brothers. And then Priyanka Chopra from Quantico? So yeah. they got married, uh, and they're of two very different religions. Okay. Like he is Christian-based, and she's very much... Sure. I think it's, it's a... I don't want to say it wrong. It might be Hindu or, or something. Okay. But they got married. They had two weddings, one of one Christian wedding, one Hindu wedding. Everything's been very like tolerant of the other's religion. Sure. Uh, what's your perspective on that? And do you think that 
that's something that everyone can do or is that something that like a very specific mindset like somebody has to have like what is, what's your take I think on? we're living in a world in which we just we we are very celebratory of tolerance um, I think it's one of the things that is typical generationally I know sometimes we I talk generations a lot when I'm on the show because you don't know but everybody that you can't see they're all millennials and I'm an ex sir talking about Bishop and my father and Carlton, who are all boomers. And I'm sandwiched Xers, all of us Xers are sandwiched in between these two huge generations. 75 million boomers, 50 million Xers, 79 million millennials. Um, one of the things that they said of the boomers is that the boomers were tolerant of diversity. They had to tolerate diversity. I mean, there's uh, I, there's things that Trump says and feels. I understand that they're shocking to you all who are millennials, but the fact of the matter is that his perspective is very typical of boomers. He is tolerant of diversity. Xers are more adapting to diversity. Millennials are celebrating of diversity. You guys want to celebrate diversity. Um, millennials want to, it's, if there's diversity, it's like, oh my God. Um, I think boomers are trying to adapt to it, but really they're just tolerant of it. And they're dealing with a generation that wants to celebrate it. And I think this whole Nick Jonas Chick Pock Oprah, I'm sorry, Oprah, I'm, I hate to just mispronounce her name, it's just so ignorant. Priyanka. Priyanka. It's just the kind of thing that we want to talk about it, especially today, because we really want to celebrate diversity. We want to celebrate tolerance. We want to celebrate, oh, everybody's okay. We want to celebrate a kind of a religious concept that hey, we're all trying to get there and everybody's trying to seek God and they're both religious people. And, um, and I get that. I, I totally understand that. My knee-jerk reaction to hearing that Nick Jonas and Priyanka married one another, even though that they're from different religions, is that they're, neither one of them is very religious. That is my that is my knee jerk reaction. That Nick Jonas is not that he may be Christian, but he he must not be that saved. If he would marry somebody who's may not believe in Jesus, who may not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Um, when someone says to me, "Oh yeah, I'm I'm a Catholic and my husband's Jewish," or "Oh yeah, I'm Jewish and my husband," you know, "Oh yeah." I'm Catholic and he's Muslim, then my response is, well, you guys must not really worship. You guys, obviously, you guys must not adhere to your religions, really. So neither one of you is really all that spiritual, is my knee-jerk reaction. You may be religious, but you're not necessarily spiritual. Now, I know that's an extra talking, and I know millennials may be mad about that, but um, I think that... Uh, I'm adapting to the tolerance of it, but I don't know if, if I would say, oh, wow, hey, kudos to you, Nick Jonas. There's a part of me that's like, uh, you, you must not be a very serious Christian if you're going to marry somebody who does not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. That's my response to that. That's all I have to say about that. All right. So some... Uh, someone asked, I know Pastor Ernie has OCF uh, for the guys, but what about the women? Can you clarify how you feel about, Listen, about that? Listen, there, there are definitely women pastors. There are definitely women who are called to pastor. There are definitely women who are in the ministry. We've got women in the church who are in the ministry. My wife is very, very involved in the ministry. My wife speaks. Uh, we've got a young girl in the church who's a part of the the One Life team, who is a young teenage girl who's, a, who's clearly going to be a preacher, and we are trying to foster her gifts. And as a result of my connection with Bishop, I've got one, one of my sisters through my connection with him, Dr. Jazz Scurlock. She's a preacher. She has a church. She recently was about to get a building. I went there. She 
can't, she called me like, yo, I saw her somewhere. She's like, Andy, I think I'm going to lease this space. You got to come help me. I want to talk to you, me and one of my guys. We flew down there at our own expense to meet with her. Walk through. You can ask her. Walked all through. Try to give her the best ideas and advice we could. I absolutely believe that there are women who are called to minister and women who are really good at it, women that God is using. And so if a woman was like, oh, I'm called to be a pastor and I want to join OCF, they absolutely could join OCF. I don't, I don't know. No, they absolutely could. I don't even want to say I don't know. I, 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 they absolutely could. I think a woman came up to me and she was just like, do you mentor women ministers? And I'm like, I absolutely would. Just in my own honesty and in my own integrity individually, I just don't know if I can mentor you as well as a woman can mentor you because I'm not a woman. So if you're if you're right now, you're watching and you're like, I'm a woman minister. I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm going to be a I know God has called me to be a senior pastor and I want mentoring. My question to you is, do you want me to mentor you? because you think I'm the one that can help you, or do you want me to mentor you because you receive validation if a man validates your ministry? If God has validated your ministry, why do you need a man's validation? Sometimes I think women who are trying to be ministers are looking more for men ministers to accept them. And I get that, and it's, I understand it, but that ain't really what it's about. If God is for you, then who could be against you? And if you really are a female pastor, and God is calling you to be a senior pastor, and you want to figure out how to be the most effective, why would you ask me? Now, I, I would never turn you away. And, and if you came and sat down with me, I'd be like, great, let's have conversations. But you're probably going to ask me a question, and I'm going to end up being like, yeah, that's a really good question. Hold on for a second, and I'm going to call Jazz. <laughs> so why not just go to her? Why not skip the middleman? The thing about my, my fellowship, OCF, is that I think I'm great, okay? I think I'm great, all right? So since I think I'm great, I have to serve. That's what Jesus said. If you want to be great, to be the servant of all, Jesus knew who he was, knew he came from God, knew he was going to return to God. So he took his outer garment off, wrapped the towel around himself, and washed his disciples' feet. If I'm great, then I have to wash your feet. I was in a situation one time when I first started the church in which some of the guys that were connected, some of the like, guys that I had been mentoring personally that moved to North Carolina with me, did something in the church where they wanted to wash my feet, and I... It was like after a service, and I just kind of had to let them go ahead and do it because I couldn't stop it. But it's absolutely backwards. If you, if you were to come to me and be like, Pastor Andy, you are a man of God. You are so great. I just tell you, man, you got it going on. The anointing of God is on you, man. And I just feel like I, I'm supposed to be under your authority, and, and, you, and we're going to foot wash after that. Then as you're talking, you need to be – coming over with a basin and taking your shoes off and taking your socks off and dipping your feet in the water and saying, so wash my feet. It's not you wash my feet. It's you put your feet in the water. If I, you think I'm great, then you would put me in a situation to wash your feet. And I think that that's a part of the problem with the whole, and I'm not trying to be critical of the whole apostolic bishop -y attitude, but it's almost kind of this thing of, oh, I'm the, oh, I'm, now I'm, I'm a king and you treat me like it. But the truth of the matter is that actually, I think I'm great, so I have to find people I can serve. You're a female minister. God's hand is on you. His anointing is on you. He wants to use you for his glory, and he wants to use you in a pastoral situation, especially to be a senior pastor. I'm asking myself, am I the best person to serve you? Can you serve me and be a part of my thing and make me feel so I can say, oh, I've got blah, 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 churches in my fellowship. Sure. But can I serve you? I don't know. And that would be the only reason why I would say, uh, it's not because I have any issue with female ministers. It's not like, nope. I was, I was at something and Dr. Arisha Hillier was there. 
And I saw her and I was like, yo, what's up, Irish? And she's like, hey, Andy, we like, we talking. I'm not like, you know, you're not supposed to be. No, I'm like, oh, girl, Bishop Hilliard turned his church over to his daughter and we all like, go, girl, you do it. I'd send you to her. In the hopes that she will be able to serve you best for you to reach the ultimate limits of what God wants to use you to do. So as a follow-up to that, um, how do we as women find mentors in the church? I mean, I, it's, it's very interesting to me that, you know, that women will come to me and be like, oh, I want to be involved in the ministry. And it's, and whenever they say that to me, it's well, at World Overcomers anyway, when they come to me about World Overcomers, I want to be used in the ministry and they come to me. Once again, it's very similar to what I just said. I think they're looking for my validation. I think they're looking for me to recognize them or for me to acknowledge them. My initial response to them is, yo, yo, jump in there with Phyllis and Free. Like they are doing no joke women's ministry in no uncertain terms. Okay. They are, they got Bible study groups. They got, they have stuff they're doing. They are ministering to one another. This, if you want to minister, there's tons of opportunities to minister, jump in, get down with it. And there's a connection there and you can find everything you're looking for in there. Cause my wife is the first lady, but she's also over the women's ministry at the church. And they, there's a lot that they do. Um, and there's leadership within it. And if you get in there and serve and are faithful, you will, you will definitely find what you need. If you're looking for it from me, I don't really mentor women really. Not really. Gosh, now I've seemed like I'm just, saying no to the question I was asked previously. But I mean, I, I'm not saying I wouldn't, I wouldn't be down for a woman to be in the fellowship, but I don't know how much of a personal relationship she's really gonna have with me. I don't really, you know, she's young enough to be a daughter, that's probably different. But um, if you're looking for mentors in the church, female men, if you're a woman and you're like, I wanna be mentored, then there are definitely women in the ministry especially world overcomers within fearless and free that definitely will mentor you. All right. So, um, what do you do when you're tired and stressed and not motivated? Um, you know, at a certain time, like if you ever hit a period where like maybe you get, um, I don't know, just kind of lethargic or like maybe you feel mentally tired. Sure. I think for me, you know, one of the things I said at the OCF event is that you have to be careful that you're burning your oil and not your wick. You're only burnt out because you've let your oil run dry. You have to keep your lamp trimmed. You have to keep yourself filled. And the thing that fills you is all the spiritual stuff, songs and hymns and spiritual songs and worship. And, you know, yesterday before church, I was playing like, Look, broke out an old hill song, song, I will never be the same again. And it, that song's from like 2002. I hadn't heard that song in so long, darnly Shack. And it was just like hearing it again for the very first time. And I just felt the anointing of God. And making sure that you're staying full of the spirit keeps you from just getting dry and burnt out. It's also possible to become weary in your well-doing. That's why the word says, do not be weary in your well-doing because you will reap a harvest if you faint not. And sometimes you get tired because well-doing is hard work. And uh, sometimes I think that we can be surprised at fatigue. But to me, fatigue is a sign, especially if you're doing the right thing, fatigue is a sign that you worked hard. If you're watching this and you work out, and I'm not working out right now, okay? I'm, I'm January 1, I'm back. I mean, not January 1, January 8th when, I, when the fast is over. I'm back, I'm back on my grind. But there's a, there's a sign when you're working out that your muscles are reaching a place of fatigue. And it's possible to work out and never get your muscles to a place of fatigue. It's, 
It's absolutely possible. There are people who work out all the time and they, their bodies aren't changing because they don't push their body to a place where it is tired. So sometimes that lethargic, that, oof, that, oh my God, I'm so tired. Sometimes that's a good sign. Sometimes that means that you really are working hard. And if, you're, if that work is behind something that's good, then that's a good thing. You may not think so, but because you may just think that I'm just sitting here just like, oh, oh anybody can do that. But actually, after, these, after this hour-long thing of these Q&As, when I'm done, a lot of times, I'm like mentally fatigued. Like, I'm just, I feel drowsy. Like, I'm like, oof, I'm tired, I'm sleepy. And if I have more to do, then I may, I very rarely, I, we do this on Thursdays because Thursday is a day in which I don't do a lot of administrative stuff. It's hard for me to do administrative, organizational stuff and creative stuff at the same time. I'm just too mentally drained. If we're, if we're gonna, if, if I was gonna have a meeting, it would have been before this. Once we do this, all of us together, when this is done, I'm like, woo, I'm done. I'm tired. Um, that's not a bad thing. It's also possible to become weary because you are doing something that is a waste of your energy and time. And that's a whole nother story altogether. Now, if you're getting weary in your well-doing, well, the word says, do not be weary in your well-doing, you will reap a harvest. And so the dream and the belief of harvest will help you to not to be weary. But it's also possible for you to be tired because what you are putting your energy behind is a waste. And if that's the case, then you need to change what you're putting your energy behind. What do I do when I feel overly tired or overly lethargic? If it lasts for too long, I'm like, I need a vacation. I need to get away. If I start snapping at people, if I start snapping over stuff that's just the normal wear and tear of just being in a ministry and doing all of this, when Morgan calls me and I'm like, what? Then I'm like, okay, I need a vacation because really the work we're all doing together is actually really good. Doesn't mean we never get tired. But it's actually good work, and the fatigue is a good thing. But if it turns negative, then I need a break. But it, it may be possible that I've turned negative because I'm doing something, I'm not getting results, or I'm doing something, and it's not what I should be doing. I think if you're really called to do it, then it's only going to make you but so tired. Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And learn from me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Meaning that if you have the yoke of God on you, if you're doing what he's calling you to do, it's a yoke, but it's not heavy to you because it's what you're called to do. I don't really know if you're called to do it, if it's really wearing you out that much. And if, if you really are called, then go to the beach. Take a break. Go to the movies. Sometimes I, part of the reason why I talk about movies, I go to the movies because my brain never shuts up. So sometimes I go to the movies just to make my brain be quiet. Sometimes I'm talking to a first lady and, and I'm just, blah, 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 blah. I'm thinking five down there, seven down, five years down the line, seven years down the line, 10 years down the line, what's gonna happen? And when I'm 95, when I'm 92, you know what I'm gonna do when I'm 97? I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have, I'm already, I've already got plans for when I'm 80. I'm gonna have like a real cool gray goatee and I'm gonna have like a cane, even though I don't need it. I'm gonna lean, and my cane is also gonna be able to be a grabber that will grab stuff off the shelf. And, and I'm, I may even have a scooter chair because I just don't want to walk everywhere. But I'm, I'm, you know, so I'll be like in there, ee, ee. and then when I want something on a high shelf, I'll just get up and stand up and just take it down. And people will be like, I thought you need a scooter chair. And I'm like, no. And by then, the scooter chairs will probably be like hovercrafts or something. And I, I'm already, th sometimes when I'm doing that, blah, 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 LaShawn is like, honey, oh my God, honey, you need to go to the movies. Now I know some of you, you just, Blaze up some weed, Jarrell. No, you just blaze up some weed. But, but no, no, it's not weed that 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 you're supposed to blaze. Go blaze up Star Wars. Go blaze up. Go. Just just to get away, just to shut it out for a second. That 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 two hours, two and a half hours to not think is a great thing, and you need to get rest. I don't know why I'm messing with Jarrell today. <laughs> All right. Um. Great question, just just came in. 
I'm not, <laughs> and it's kind of, I don't know if it's supposed to be comical. I mean, there's a laugh out loud in here, so we'll see. I met a guy who lied and said he was the trash man to see if I was a gold digger. He actually worked in IT. Laugh out loud. But later, he did not like how unimpressed or unaffected I was by his actual income. How do you date when men say no gold diggers, but still want you to show interest in the money they have or make? Whew. I think the term gold digger is a really weird term. I, I understand it, okay? The idea of gold diggers, I, I guess I get that. I think at the foundation of the idea of a gold digger is a woman who's interested in your money and not really all that interested in you. So it's just like, your money is what, they, is what they're after and they don't really care about you at all. They just care about your money. So they're with you because of your money. Um, here's the thing. The thing of it is, is that fundamentally, foundationally, there is actually a health in that though. Because a woman is looking for a certain amount of strength. A woman is looking for a certain amount of provision. And what's more, a woman, since a woman's position to some extent can be a bit submissive, it's supposed to be anyway, that's easier to do if you actually have some stuff together. It's easier to submit to you if you got some stuff going on. And so we have to be careful not as guys not to be like, oh, you just about my money. Well, to some extent, a quality woman is gonna be looking for somebody that actually has some stuff together. It swings both ways. So a man has to be, a man is looking for someone who really loves him, even though his assets are there, he's trying to find someone that really cares about him, just like an attractive woman or a woman is looking for someone who really loves her beyond her assets. For men, that has a tendency to be physical qualities. Like hips and boobs and hair and face. And so my point is, is that well, let's say you're a woman and there's, there's an aspect of men, men are looking and it's not just cultural, it's not just generational, it's something that's been going on for thousands of years, thousands of years. Men are interested in a certain amount of hips. Men are interested in a certain amount of boobs. Some of that is because it's a sign of maturity. Some of that is because we are hardwired for procreation. And so we're trying to figure out, can you carry my seed? Can you feed my seed? There's a procreative foundational aspect of it. Now, you as a woman have got to find somebody. You can't walk around with a sh shroud to cover up your body because you think, oh, that's all you're just interested in my ass. Oh, you just, in, uh huh, just looking at my hips. You can't cover up your hips because your hips, some of your hips or your boobs or your face or your, all the, those things do make you attractive. You're trying to find somebody that really loves you for you beyond those assets. In the same way, a guy is trying to find somebody that loves him for him beyond his assets, beyond his whatever, how he looks or his car or his money or his job or whatever. But that doesn't mean that I, I would never tell a woman that I, I would never do that. I would never be like, oh yeah, I'm a garbage man. I would, I, I would never do that. First of all, garbage men make some money. First of all, there's garbage men make money. Okay. And there's guys that are, that are doing garbage that got all kinds of other stuff on the side. There are some blue collar workers that are making more than, than teachers. And so what, what we knocking down garbage men? There's garbage men who got, got stuff going on and they're, that's what they do early in the morning and then they got their own businesses on the side later on. You better don't be sleeping on no garbage man. Um, but I'm just saying that it's like, ju that's just like a woman walking around in a disguise and there are women who do that. There are women who are like, yup, nasty, cause he need to love me for leave me. And I'm like, well, Okay, I mean, I hear that, but 
Is anybody asking you out? Okay. So, you know what? You need to, you need to shine it up and do your hair and put something on your lips. I'm amazed at how dry and ashy people be looking and they have to deal with the public. It's incredible to me. It's, it's mind blowing. I mean, you're a woman. So it's you, you can actually put something on your face. It's like socially acceptable. I'm a man and I can shave all the hair off my face. So if I'm a man and I can shave all the hair off my face, there's no reason for you to be a woman and haven't shaved the hair off of your face. You're going to try to make me look deeper. I mean, okay, I, I get that. And I, I totally understand it. You want someone that's going to see past just the exterior. I totally get that. Me too. But just understand that that doesn't mean that you should now camouflage. That's a mistake. And the same is true with, with who you are as a guy. The search is still the search is the search. You're trying to find somebody who loves you for you. You're trying to love, find somebody. As a guy, you're trying to find a woman who loves you more than she loves the idea of being with someone. That's a challenge. As a woman, you're trying to find a man who wants you physically, but that's not all it's about. But let's not act like it's not about that. Because if you end up with a guy who never touches you, you're gonna be like, what's going on? He doesn't even touch me. So you don't wanna be so androgynous that I'm not attracted to you. Anyway. I hope I answered the question. My point is, is, you know, I think the question was kind of also now I'm not impressed. And I think that that's a different question because I think that one of the things that has happened in our world now is that there are women out there that are so aggressive and so forward and so thirsty that they make all thirst look bad. But there's nothing wrong with a certain amount of thirst. You're looking at me like, you understand what I'm saying? So I, I, I do want some thirst. That doesn't necessarily mean you have to be thirsty. Like, ah, 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 you're so incredible. You're so amazing. Oh my God. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that I want to be treated with a certain amount of total nonchalance. Like, if I say something impressive, be impressed. I was talking to, you know, this dude, you know, and he's, you know, he's dating this, this woman. And, you know, she's just, she's a little, she's kind of a little sweaty, you know. She's not ridiculously thirsty, but she just, she says good stuff about him. And not only does she say stuff, good stuff about him to him, but she says good stuff about him to, like, her friends. Okay, because she's saying good stuff about him, and he likes that. So I was like, yo, that's dope. So I was like, so we're moving. So Wednesday, I'm like, yo, I'm going to pack my own stuff, which is really something I probably should do anyway. But I'm like, I'm going to pack my own stuff. <laughs> so when, when LaShawn came back from working out, I'm in there all packing up like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And she's just like, what brought this on? And I'm like, yeah, I want you to talk about me. And she was like, I've been with you 30 years. It's like, <laughs> I, I hear you, but I still want, can I just get a, can I get a little bit? I don't need a gallon of water. Can I just get, can, you, can I get a little, can I, okay. Can I get, can I get a cap full of thirst? Can I get a little bit, just a touch? I can't get no water. It's like. I want a certain amount of thirst, okay? So for you to just be like, Psh, don't nobody care about your six figure. Don't say that. You don't want it to all be about his money, but it, you don't want it to not be about the stuff because, hey, the man makes money. And you should be like, wow, that's really great. You make a lot of money. I'm proud. That's awesome. That's really cool. 
You got time for one more? Yeah, sure, man. Come on, we started late. All right. Let's see what I can. Let's roll for the hour. The how do you effectively serve slash minister to a multi generational, multi ethnic, and multicultural congregation without compromising who you are? Should you compromise who you are? And this guy said it's a church that he didn't that he may not establish or build. I mean, I think you know Paul talks about being all things to all men that I might win some. So I think that there is an aspect of the ministry that is about. Okay, you know, I, I'm not just going to be me. Um, I think at the same time, there's a way that the Lord wants to use you. And if he's using you in a particular way, he's going to use you based on who you are ethnically. Um, I'm not going to be less black to minister to Korean people better. Um, They'll, they're, they'll have to be able to receive the Holy Spirit from me in however black I am. And I, I don't know if I'm the blackest black person in, in the whole wide world. I'm certainly not the blackest person in this room right now, okay? There's people in here way blacker than me, although this is my tech crew, and so, no Morgan. And so, you know, my tech crew, even my tech crew, we not the blackest black people. We black people, but we ain't the blackest black people. I'll just say that. But my point is, is I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be as black as I need to be, and still be used. I'm not. I'm not gonna compromise who I am. Um, although, so I'm, I think we're walking that fine line. I don't know if it's one or the other. I don't know if it's oh, I'm gonna totally deny myself completely, totally who I am, and oh no, I'm just gonna totally compromised. I don't know if it's, I'm going to just, yep, it's no longer me. I want Christ to be seen. And certainly it's more of him, less of me. Yep. I want Christ to be seen as best, as best I can, but, um, I am the vessel that he's determined to use. And so there is going to be an aspect of me being me. The question to me was, how do you minister to a multi-generational, multicultural, multi-ethnic? I think that the key is love. And I think that you, have, one of the reasons why I have so many millennials in our church is because I spend a lot of time with them and I really love them. I, it's almost weird when I'm not with them. So you're not going to be able to minister to them if you don't love them. You know, and, you, and the love comes from connection and relationship and intimacy and talking and spending time with them. Um, the same is true culturally. You're... you're, you're you're never going to love white people if you don't spend any time with any white people. And you're going to spend some time with some white people that you don't like. But that's okay. You'd have to find somebody else. You'll have to keep going until you find a white person that you do like. Because believe me, you'll find some white people that you like. And you'll find some white people that you won't like. Just like there's black people that you don't like. If you're black, there's black people you don't like. So just because you bump into a white person that you don't like, don't, that doesn't mean all white people are like that. You just bumped into that kind of white person. Whereas just like black people, there's a whole bunch of black people that I'm just like, yeah, hey. So my point is, is without that love, you're never going to really make a real connection. Um, and so if it really is about being effective, then love's a factor in it. Um, and the same is true generationally, you know. If you find there's there's some old people that get on your nerves, there's some old people that don't. Some old people that are really cool. There's older people that go to my church. There's boomers at my church. And the boomers that go to my church, they're not all like, hey, y'all jump too much. They, they're like, oh, I love this church's energy. And they, they're trying to jump. They don't jump high, but they jump. They jump, they jump this high. They're, but they're, they're still over there. They're, they're amen and they don't want to be. They, Last night, after last night's service, a, a, a gentleman walked over to me. He walked slow, but he walked over to me, and he came over. Clearly, he probably was old enough to be, definitely old enough to be my father, maybe my grandfather. I mean, it's just an a aged African-American man, and I just was like, oh, my God, man. That, you know, he just came up and was like, you were talking to me. That word was to me. I, quite honestly, I don't even know I was preaching to him. I was preaching to these people. But he walked up to me and was like, no, that was a word for me. And I was like, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. I hugged him, 
thanked him for being there. Thanks for coming. He wasn't in here like, it's too many young people in here. I, I bumped into people that, you got all them young folk. And it's like when they say it, it's almost like, like we stink. Like, I mean, I would go to your church, Pastor Annie, but you got all them young people. Like, what are you trying to say? <laughs> right. <laughs> you're not going to have them if you're like that. Um, and so, you know, love is the key to it. And if all of a sudden you find out that there's, a, that, you know, there's like some, all of a sudden there's like, there's a bunch of Hispanic people, like Latin people that are coming up. But they're, they're not, and some of them are Mexican. And one of the guys from uh, Venezuela, I think, he told me. Gosh. Anyway. Was it Venezuela? I don't want to say the wrong country. But anyway, it's a great guy. And we met and we talked. And we were, tr actually, we were trying to talk to each other. And he's talking to me as much English as he can speak. It's not his native language. I don't speak no Spanish because I'm an American and I'm spoiled and I'm horrible. So I can't speak to him. So I was just like, man, we're going to have to have another meeting. And I'm going to have somebody, one of the elders at my church is bilingual. Her name is Dion. And I'm like, I'm going to have a meeting so that we can talk to each other. But then if you don't know what to say, you can blah, 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 And she can say it to me and I can say something. Or tell him I said this. So I'm saying all that to say that. I spent time with him and I loved him. I thought, he, oh my God, he cried, I cried. I'm like, oh my God, I love this dude. So how am I gonna minister to more Hispanics? By spending more time with them and actually loving them. And then it opens up a part of your heart to actually minister to them. If you're a white guy right now and you wanna be multicultural, I wanna have multicultural people in my church. My question is, do you wanna have black people in your church because you care about black people? Or do you want to have black people in your church because you feel like it's a sign that your church is good? Don't try to minister to us if you don't care. We don't need you that bad. Don't do us no favors. But if you see, if you're a, pa if you're a white pastor and you have black people in your church, then when you see a young black man shot by a cop, you should be horrified horrified and if you're not angry and horrified then you really shouldn't be pastoring us you really shouldn't you really really shouldn't it ought to drive you to tears you ought to be upset you ought to be incensed so um it's kind of like bridging off of that how is it how is it I know in like a lot of multicultural services, they like structure, they could, it's almost like you get into like too much of like the programming and structuring aspect of your service to kind of identify with a lot of different types of people. Like, how do you feel like from your perspective as a senior pastor, how do you feel you approach your service structure and making sure like, do you like, how do you approach that process and making sure that your service is exactly how you want it to be or how you want it to feel? Do you overthink it? Do you think about it a lot? Like, what, what is your approach? I think the thing about World Overcomers, I, and I don't, you know, I know there are people that are watching this all over the place. I think if you've ever been to World Overcomers, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm not throwing any shade, I'm not saying anything, no shade meant. I just don't know if World Overcomers is your typical African American experience church. Uh, I think that. There's, there's a lot of passion, a lot of energy. We got a lot, we, we got people that are coming from that. Um, and so, you know, Tam is definitely hollering, okay? <laughs> but, you know, under the anointing, but she's doing it with lights and LED screens behind her and sound that works. And I mean, that sounds horrible, not sound that works, but just, it's just not, it, it's not necessarily your typical African-American experience of robes and choirs, and it's just not that. Not that we don't have a choir, we do, but um, I think that World Overcomers has tried to come to the middle a bit. Um, and I think that that had more to do with me then it had to be to do with being intentional about trying to attract white people. And 
which is a good thing because if I did it to attract white people, then I failed because it did it didn't work. Um, so, I mean, our church is predominantly African American, and we do have some white people at the church, and that's I love them. It's awesome. It's great. And I'm totally open to minister to anyone of any, because we're all the human race. We all are descended from Adam and Eve. We're all the human race. Different cultures, one race. Um, but I think right now in America, we, we definitely have a racial issue. And I don't know if white people are comfortable following black leadership. Um, certainly not in the church world. So I don't want to get too deep into that because I don't want to. Uh, I think I've talked about it before. I had nauseam and I don't want to seem like I'm hating because I'm not, I'm not hating. If you gave me a choice of a racially diverse church that had 500 people in it under my leadership and 10,000 black people, I'll take 10,000 black people. I'm totally comfortable with my people. I'd love to be multi. I'd love to be multicultural. I just don't know if it's up to me. Um, but it certainly isn't because our service is so overly black, whatever that means. I don't. I think our experience at World Overcomers is a little bit more in the middle, and I think there are it, there are aspects of it that are definitely. The passion, the music, the pop, the, the, the worship. I think music has a lot to do with it. Um, whether a per, I, Why don't more white people go to World Overcomers? I think it's because they will have to be comfortable with being minority for a period of time. And I don't know. White people just aren't really used to that. They're just not. Um. We're we're more used to it than they are. They're just not. They're just not. Y'all just if you're watching, y'all just ain't. Y'all just aren't even used to it. Um, which I and I'm not even mad about that. You're just not. You just people get really mad about some of the comments that Trump has made. Um, but I mean, America is 80 percent white. Maybe a little less. Maybe 77 percent. It's 80 percent white. Black people make up 10% of the population. What is Hispanics? 12, 30%. It's 80% white. Um, I, I want my president to be sensitive to the minorities. Uh, I think it's important. Uh, at the same time, America's a white nation. <laughs> and I think that the president's job is to some extent to think about his country. When Trump said that, I I, I kind of agree. With, I agree with that to some extent. His job is to think about his country. I think we, we there is a responsibility to the world because we all share this planet, and that's important. Um, but there are definitely challenges in the country, and um, I don't you know. I don't starting to sound like a Trump supporter or something, but (laughs) it's definitely a challenge. Hey, let me just say this when it comes to immigration. I think that we we either need to do one or the other. We either need to, we either need to give every single solitary immigrant, every person that's come to the country, we need to give every single one of them a green card. We need to start walking around handing them out. Just give everybody a green card, give everybody a social security number, and then just Everybody's legal and everybody's taxed and we all, cause we're all here together. I don't know, it's not necessarily fair for them to experience the benefits of being in this country and don't have any of the responsibility for it by taxation. Cause then what ends up happening to a person like me is I end up having to pay all the taxes for people who, okay. I pay a lot in taxes and I owe taxes right now. So, um, we either are gonna 
make it so they can't come here at all, which to me is ridiculous. I don't think the we need we need all this diversity, and and there are there are roles that they that they play and will play that are going to bless the nation. So we either make everybody legal, or we build a wall. We can't be in this in between place uh, because. To some extent, there's there is a point. There is a point that the economy is greatly affected by greed. Um, I don't know how I got into this, but anyway, anywho, um, America definitely has a racial issue, and uh, love is the answer. Love is the key to it. But I think we have to acknowledge it. I think one of the things that we, we don't want to acknowledge it, we just want to act like, oh, it's not here. But it's here. We're still dealing with it. That's our hour. We've been great. It's been good. Next Thursday, we'll be back again. Hopefully, hopefully we'll be back in the office, back at the church. We were here today because I'm moving and I'm trying to, you know, play this hero ball. But anyway. Um, let them know that they can go to your website if they have like questions. During yeah, the week. questions during the week. Please go to the website, pastorandy.com. Let us know. We'd love to get questions. I feel like today's questions weren't just relationship question, questions, which is really great. And, uh, but peace out.